here at Amber Cattle Company. This is located in Fairfield, Virginia. And we are a South Pole grass cattle cow-calf operation. And we sell replacement heifers, seed stock, and we also sell steers to grass finishers in the area. The last 15 years, we've been a lot more intensive about our grazing management, soil health practices, um, and just really been getting into it. So this is, this farm here is 160 open acres. It's kind of a long rectangle and we have it split up into 10 permanent paddocks and a temporary electric fence, which we definitely do. We try to rotate the cows about every one to two days at the moment. Hopefully this summer we're hoping to increase the intensity of that as well. The breed that we raise here at Ember Cattle Company are known as South Pole Grass Cattle. And this is a fairly new breed in terms of cattle breeds, you know, in their history. They're about 30 years old. They were created and developed to handle the heat that we definitely have here in the southeast of the United States. They were bred and developed to be raised and grazed on forage only and they're a bit of a moderate framed animal. So the mama cows are about 1,000 to 1,100 pound animals. As you can see, they're red hided and that helps them kind of tolerate that heat a little bit more. They're really great for grass finishing and they're just really sweet, docile um, cattle. We have about 10 permanent paddocks here on this particular farm. Depending on what my grazing goals are at a specific time of year, I can take that five acre paddock or that 20 acre paddock. We can break it up by using temporary electric fence and step in posts. I think I describe it um, as rotational grazing a lot of times because that's a very broad term. Um, certain times of the year, I'm definitely a lot more intensive about it. Or um, another way of describing it that I really like that I've heard is adaptive grazing. And so there's different ways to graze. And I think just staying adaptive, depending on what your animal performance needs are. Uh, right now, I'm going into peak lactation time. So my mama cows are really needing a lot of nutrition uh, for that milk production. So I like to make sure that they've got adequate forage so that they can handle that. So I'll graze a little differently now than I will when they're dry cows. So with adaptive grazing, you can really make it for what your herd and your soils need at certain times of the year. So like this here, just, you know, you see the woven wire um, fence here. So this is just a paddock and you can take it and break it up into smaller, just smaller sections to kind of give the cows, you know, kind of a tighter, tighter grazing. and. As you can see right here, these are mama cows mostly, and they all have a calf on them. There is heifers in there, first year heifers, which are females that are hopefully be bred this year. And then the bulls just got put in this year. So the forage base here on this particular farm is definitely fescue dominant. But the beautiful thing about this farm in particular is that we have a lot of diversity out here. We also have orchard grass, bluegrass, purple top, Johnson grass. We've got different forbs, chicory, um, bladder campin. We've got dandelion, we've got plantain, we've got red clover, white clover. I mean, it just goes on and on. We have, uh, we planted 12 acres of native warm season grasses eight years ago at this farm and that includes big blue, little blue, and Indian grass. I did a soil test on that pasture last year, and by the way that we've managed it and the different forage species between the two, the natives actually have a 1% higher organic matter level in them than the other one. So it's been a bit of a journey for me the last 16 years, 15 years for sure, between how I grew up on our small, 20, 30 cow-calf operation and the way we grazed and managed to what we're doing now. We would have very large paddocks and we would rotate them maybe once a month. And we used some inputs, you know, we used chemical fertilizers, we used insecticides on our cattle, hormones, um, injection or the, imp the implant. But when I decided to <laughs> drop out of college early, college just wasn't wasn't the thing for me and decided to come home and, and take the farm to the next level. Uh, I started doing a lot of research into 
higher input systems and how I could bring that cost down. And that's really what led me to, at that point in time, it was called sustainable agriculture. And that really resonated with me. I was like, okay, this is, this seems to be more like a, a, a more profitable way to raise cattle. So you're bringing the inputs down, these outside inputs down, but you're also doing a much, much better job of managing your grasses. And that is a key point. We're not just sustaining what we have, but we're actually taking our landscape and our forages and our pastures and making them better. That's a whole new level of rotational grazing and that's been the whole kind of key to Ember Cattle Company's, I'll say success at this point. So our transition from having some more outside inputs to being more cycling within ourselves as an operation and, and less outside inputs, you know, for, for me, that's from a financial perspective that I really wanted to do that, but it's also from an ecological perspective of gaining health. Farming is not the most lucrative career path to choose and so I was really looking for a way to bring my inputs down. I was really hoping to get my cows genetics to a point where their fly load was way way down so I didn't need to use insecticides or I didn't need to use hormone implants because they were just growing me a beautiful calf on forage only so I didn't need that extra boost. And we started splitting up our farm from these larger paddocks to our smaller ones and being more intensive, intensive and thoughtful about our grazing. We've seen just the phenomenal benefits of it. Just these little signs here and there has been really telling to know that our transition is happening successfully. You know, we're able to make a profit every year, which is great. So regenerative farming can be profitable. I think if I could have back then found the right genetics for my operation faster, I would be further along with my animal genetics than I am now. For me to be a profitable regenerative farm, it's not just about the grazing management, but I also couple that with having the right livestock genetics for not only your environment, but your grazing style, your grazing management. And if you can couple those two aspects together, that really sets you up for success. And I think if you can go out and find that farm that is grazing or managing their systems like you want to, buy animals from them, bring those onto your operation, and you're gonna be years ahead. Every year we wean steer calves. So we are a cow-calf operation. Our mamas have calves every year. We will castrate the bull calves and we will sell the steers to grass finishing operations in the area. They usually take those four to 500 pound wean steer calves and finish them out for another year on grass and they direct sell their meat. We also sell replacement heifers. Um, so again, I've been really focused on the genetics of this herd to have animals that thrive on a forage only system. And so I like to sell replacement heifers or bred heifers sometimes to other grass operations that want those types of genetics, that want animals that can thrive on forage only and are docile animals, can tolerate some of our Virginia heat. So Kentucky 31 fescue here in Virginia is uh, infected with a fungus that can cause a lot of vasoconstriction, which just doesn't allow the cows to let off a lot of heat during the summertime. So you'll see a lot of symptoms from cattle that are suffering from this toxicity with uh, rough or wooly coats. They'll lose tail switches. If it's really, really bad, they might lose hooves. Um, so it can be pretty nasty. So one way that I've combated that is number one with having some cattle that have a bit more tolerance for that fescue. But the second thing that I do a lot of is having a lot of diversity out here in the pasture. So if they've got different forages that they can pick from, they will nibble and eat and consume some of that fescue during the middle of summer. It's not that palatable, but they will consume it. But if they've got red clover or white clover or dandelion or chicory or bladder camping or whatnot to also put in their, their gut system, that really helps with the toxicity load um, that they might get from the fescue. So when you have a lot of pasture diversity, that creates a lot of room and space for other species of wildlife to come in um, or our farm life. I'm a huge fan of dung beetles. And so over the years, I've seen those come back 
and we don't use insecticides anymore. So they are here thriving in our environment, our grassland environment. And you wouldn't think that plant diversity would play much into dung beetle activity, but it really does. They, they like manure that the animals have been consuming a diverse diet. There's a lot of flowers out here. We can see some white clover right here in front of us and red clover. Um, and the pollinator species and the bugs just thrive in these systems. That then allows for, we see these tree swallows out here swooping around for them to come in. We've got meadow larks, red-winged blackbirds. We've got turkey, we've got deer. When you have diversity in your pastures, it doesn't just stop with the diversity of the plants. It really brings on the diversity of all these other animals to your system, which just help make these systems cycle that much more better. More better, <laughs> yeah. Oh, if you don't have soil health, you're missing a lot. It's not just because that's the right thing to do. Soil is a living organism. We need to start looking at it that way. It's not just inert material that we can chemically change or physically change at a whim, even though we can. Uh, we need to start looking at it as a living, as a living uh, a creature, I guess, even though it's trillions of living creatures under there. Grasslands and ruminants have evolved together and they really need each other. One of the great things about the way cattle graze versus sheep or horses is that they graze by using their tongue almost. So they actually go out to the grasses and what they want to consume, they wrap their tongues around and yank. And when they do that, they are allowing those, car those uh, carbohydrate stores and those plants that are usually down lower in the plant to stay intact. Um, if you allow them to overgraze and be there too long, they will get that down further. But if they go around the first pass around a field and they just wrap their tongues, rip and pull, that uh, is a, a great way for grasses to be grazed. Number two, it also creates this kinetic energy within that plant itself. It's like a, a shock almost to that plant, the vibration and the pulling and yanking action of that cattle grazing that plant kind of stimulates a lot of the roots to kind of go into overdrive. And not only that, but the saliva and all the biology in the cow saliva that coat that plant as they wrap their tongue around it actually helps increase the diversity. When the cow moves across the field, they slough off uh, the biology that's on their hide and their fur and everything like that. And that can return and inoculate the soils as well. And like scenes like this is why I farm. And this scene here is why I consistently move cows because right now we're looking at the cows in waist high forage that's lush and just ready to be consumed. The beautiful Blue Ridge Mountains are in the background. The swallows are swooping in and out, catching their breakfast this morning. And you just know that the cows are just happy and content. They're, they're quiet, they're calmly just moving around, grazing, eating the grass tips, eating the lush blades, the clovers. Those scenes are exactly what motivates me to keep going every day because this is cow heaven here on earth. I don't think they can get much better than this. And uh, that makes me, makes me happy when my cows are happy, for sure.